speaker is uh, Robert Chen. Uh, he's uh, from CISIN, the Center for International Earth Science Information Network, and also representing the NASA Socioeconomic Data and Application Center, CDAC, um, a, a, a member of, uh, of the World Data System. Uh, Bob, the floor is yours. Thanks. Um, I have one minute time, but uh, I'm just changing. I'm going to change the context of this because I'm going to give you a completely opposite view than what was just presented about how science should approach uh, the issues we have. And my argument, and uh, you know, we've been struggling to try to get uh, data into future Earth for years, and it seems like, even though you want to partner, you're starting from scratch. And that's, I think, a big mistake. We have crisis on our hands. We've heard about it in this meeting. We don't have time to do the traditional approach. So I'll give you an example. <laughs> Of how to do it. My own thing. Advance. So uh, the basic premise is: Why do we need integrated policy relevant indicators? They're good for a lot of things. They, uh, you know, it is this gap between data and usable knowledge. It is trying to focus that thousands and thousands of too complex things into things that are simpler that the general public, politicians, have understand. Understand. It's trying to get something that has consensus that people can focus on. You know, in the dark and stormy night, it's nice to have the, the uh, beacons, and it's, it's helping to cut across all the different disciplines that are sitting around this table and beyond. Um, that's, that's uh, about um, and you have to remember the world runs on indicators. Whenever an economic indicator comes out, you know, businesses jump, governments run around. They do stuff based on indicators. They're, you know, when a government agency releases it, it's a secret, and people get upset when they think the indicators have been tampered with by, you know, for political reasons. They're a big deal. We do it every day. When we go to the hospital, and that's data. But, you know, the doctors have been trained to pick up on certain things that are representative of the health, your health state. It's not everything. They have used experience to understand that there's certain things worth paying attention to and then allows them to decide when to drill down more, get more tests, and so forth. So we use indicators all the time. But why don't we have them in environmental arena? But it's the same thing. Um, so more than 10 years ago, our center in Yale started out thinking about how would you do indicators? And this came about because the World Economic Forum had issued global competitiveness indicators. And so every country was running around trying to improve, and they were ranked, okay? They're top, you know, medium, low. They're, they're more competitive, less competitive than last year. They're running around changing economic policy if they rank low or whatever. But that meant attention went to competitiveness. Nobody was paying attention to environment. So this was an experiment in saying, look, it doesn't matter how exactly the scientific details add up, getting some rankings in the environmental area will help balance the you know, biased attention towards things like trade and economic competitiveness with something that's environmental so that people can be compared. And they didn't like being compared. So when you say, oh, the decision maker, we want to do what they want. No, the way to get action is to do things sometimes that they don't want. They don't want to be compared. But you do it anyway. Now, there were issues with this. People complained. I mean, the, the UN Commission on Sustainable Development messed around coming up with indicators, hundreds of them, for a decade and never produced anything that anybody paid attention to. So we, we set out to do rankings that people pay attention to. And it's not in, you know, The Economist and stuff like that. But one thing was, it was about overall sustainability. And, you know, that's a big, nobody really knows what sustainability is. So over the years, we experimented a lot and these keep changing and focused on performance. That is, governments want to be compared on things they can control. And they don't want to be you know, Costa Rica doesn't want to be compared with Finland. 
they want to be compared to their peers. So we did a lot of refinements to try to focus this so it was more uh, decision oriented. And it was a narrower set of variables with things that people can control. This is the time series version. Uh, here's the 2014 version. Uh, and you know, we've improved and added to it. And in fact, um, there is a, a report came out a couple of years ago where we um, assessed cases where these data have been used. So Korea was, South Korea was ranked so low, 136 or 8, and they actually named a committee that was government, uh, federal, uh, national, uh, provincial, and city, formed a committee with non-government, and, and they actually, a lot of the changes in, in Seoul, South Korea, you know, buses, land, uh, parks, and so forth, came because they were ranked so low, they were embarrassed, they, it, it urged them to, you know, it spurred them to action on environmental improvement. It was because they were ranked in an index. Um, and there are a bunch of other examples where we can show uh, that there's an we had We had the ambassador of Totogo to the United States visit us a couple, uh, two weeks ago, you know, just to talk about the current state of their data. And it also focuses um, countries on the need to get better data, to put better data into the UN system, the World Bank, and improve and focus on the value of data. Uh, we also produce a version that's used by the US government in aid decisions. They actually have a basket of uh, 20 different indicators we provide to that uh, is used to rank countries, and they have to qualify at a certain level in order to get development aid. So they pay attention. Um, I don't have a lot of time, but this was mostly on sustainability, but there are a lot of people, uh, ourselves included, starting to think about climate vulnerability indicators. How, how do you uh, do assessments that are meaningful to governments when they're doing planning, looking at the different issues related to um, you know, exposure and sensitivity with, related to uh, uh, climate change and, and adapt, adaptive capacity and uh, So that leads into this discussion that we heard about before, which is there a broader set of uh, indicators and goals being considered. Uh, and this issue I think you just raised, which is, you know, this big data. And, and, and I urge you to remember that, that uh, you know, our lives, science included, has changed much more uh, that we, in a sense, we've changed. Yeah, I mean, we'd like to think that we help start the internet and so forth. But you know, your daily life is affected by your cell phone, your Google Map, your your ability to do processing uh, in ways that you could never have done before, and um, that's happening regardless of lots of other things going on. And uh, in the sustainable development community, this idea of a data revolution has started to take hold, and there may be some uh, uh, momentum to invest in how to uh, take advantage of that uh, in a way that I think um, <laughs> So the, the other thing I will say is um, the problem with policy is it runs on its own time frame. So the decisions about investments in the SDGs, and especially the decisions to spend money and resources, is happening this month in Addis Ababa. <coughs> so, you know, unfortunately, science tends to do its own thing on its own time and come out with a report saying, I need this, like a year or two late. Um, you know, two years from now, most of those development investment decisions may be made, and then you're kind of looking for the crumbs. So we rushed around with the Sustainable Development Solutions Network and others to try to get in a first cut, you know, something, even if crude, in the policy world is better than nothing. It's nothing. Very cool. um, so we have a report. We're delivering something to the honest meeting. We're going to be uh, uh, visible at the SDG summit in September because you have to have something on the table for Creed members. Really, this argument that um, you know Lomborg is saying, oh, you shouldn't spend billions of dollars monitoring because you could better spend those that money on development. 
would never fly in the private sector. The private sector spends tons of money. You know, they put in just-in-time delivery. They have to know where their stuff is. They put a lot of money into monitoring and data. And because if you can put 10 or 15% in, but it makes your 85% of your other investment even 20% more effective or, or more efficient, you're still ahead. And the public sector doesn't get this, but we need to make that case. So um, just to wrap up, it's all, we did the same sort of exercise. What are the kinds of geospatial data that could be important to key goals? Um, and more importantly, um, if you're a country, you're a developing country, how the heck? You already had trouble dealing with the Millennium Development Goals. How do you have to you deal with all the data coming related to 16 goals and hundreds of targets? And so you really have to think about capacity. Building. So in that respect, thinking uh, broadly about how to put data together, how to collect it systematically and more efficiently is a really important need. And, and we've been talking to Gates and others about how to support that kind of work. And I always like this one because, especially now that the Avengers is more popular, Incredible Hulk is a really important theme <laughs> to think about. Anyway, thanks. Thank you both. Um, <laughs> and we are running out of time. Uh, we will take only one question if it's a burning question. Like burning? No button. burning. Oh, there's one burning question. Yeah, um, my microphone. Ma please use the microphone and uh, announce your. Placeholder investment decision uh, has to be done.